Hello, how are you? I got it. Right. You've probably already gathered I'm not from Galway, but uh, in a little while you're going to be filling out those evaluation forms, so I just want to slip in that my wife is from Galway, so be nice. <laughs> she, she also claims that she's uh, related to Joe Canning, but I think half of Galway is claiming <laughs> that at the moment. Uh, it may be a lie, but anyway. I, I was asked to talk about, um, I, I gave a, a presentation in Dublin not so long ago, and Debbie asked me to come down and do a version of it here. I, I'm going to, f on benzodiazepines basically, and uh, then she told me it's digital age, so the nearest thing I've done to address digital age is basically I've put PowerPoints up, so, because um, these are old drugs, these are around since the 50s, 60s kind of time. So I'm going to fly through the presentation, it's kind of a condensed version of what I did in Dublin, but I'm going to focus particularly on trying to demystify um, I suppose benzodiazepines. The thing I find with a lot of people is to get very nervous of benzodiazepines. People, there's a lot of kind of scaremongering about them. So I'm going to try and, uh, um, I suppose, demystify them a little bit. So I'm going to mainly focus on the, I suppose, increasing people's knowledge about benzodiazepines um, and the lingo and that sort of stuff. Um, and I'm not going to focus too much on the treatment side of it, but I'll mention it because there's very good, clear documents available to you that you can download and get and follow up on that. It's, what's really important to highlight is for young people, I work mainly with under 18s up in Loudmead now, is that basically for under 18s, benzodiazepines are a very small percentage of, of even among the drug using population who actually have ever tried a benzodiazepine. They're not the main drug. By far the main drug is obviously alcohol, and by set, the second drug is by far cannabis. Okay, so these are not the mainstay that kids are doing all the time. So I don't want you to be scaremonger thinking this is what every kid is doing. So if you're feeling a bit tired and you want a nap and you can't listen to two more speakers, have a nap now and then listen to Carl because he's going to talk about cannabis, which is much more relevant in lots of ways, right? All right, so have you heard of Upjohns? Yeah, okay. Um, and you've probably heard of Roach. Okay, there you are, nice pictures. That's what the tablets look like if you've never seen them. So I'm going to talk about what they are, what's happening among teens, that sort of stuff, a bit about withdrawals and all that sort of stuff, and uh, some bit about treatment, okay? So very quickly, what we'll do is we'll go through the history. Librium, have you all heard of Librium? Yeah. It's the oldest of the benzodiazepines. It was the first that was kind of discovered in 1955. So was that, 60 odd years ago at this stage, 62 years ago? Um, and it was brought to the market by Hoffman La Roche, um, in uh, 1960, and then it was, um, they came out with Valium in 1963. For those of you who don't know, go listen to Mama's Little Helpers by the Rolling Stones. That's about Valium, okay? Um, and that was 1967 or so that song was released. So this is not new stuff that Valium is causing some significant problems. They've been around for a, a while. Interestingly, the same guy whose name is probably up there somewhere, um, in what was, they were discovered by the same guy, uh, Valium and Librium. And basically, they were the biggest selling class of drugs in 1977. Um, in 1973, sales of Valium were $230 million, which is massive. They were really, really big business. And at the time, Valium and Librium, the two drugs invented by the one guy, were basically the two best selling drugs in the world. So he's doing all right. Um, Xanax was released by the drug company Upjohn in 1981. Now Upjohn, as far as I know, as a name as a drug company is gone, but they leave Upjohn on the branding of their tablet. Um, and they have a unique history in that they were responsible for the biggest ever class action lawsuit in the UK um, against a drug company. 14,000 people registered a, a, a class action lawsuit against the drug companies. Um, um, and 1,800 law firms alone were involved. Okay, um, because they said that the manufacturers knew the dependency potential of these drugs and underplayed it, which is something drug companies are always getting accused of, where they downplay the negative effects of their drugs. Um, now, for those of you who don't know much about these, these are, these are kind of pharmaceutical grade chemicals. These are produced and sold as medicines, um, and then kind of they end up on the kind of black market and sold and all that sort of stuff. So for those who don't know, I'm just gonna explain a bit about drugs and branding and all that. If you like cola, you might be a Pepsi-Cola kind of person, or you might be a Coca-Cola kind of person, or you might be a bit cheap like me, and you'll go to Little or Aldi and you'll buy their brand. And that's fine, but it's cola. Does that make sense? But Pepsi is a brand, Coca-Cola is a brand. And drug companies, just like the alcohol companies, are very significant with their branding. So basically, this is a box of Valium tablets. Valium is a brand name. The drug name is diazepam. 
okay? So the drug name, no matter who sells it, because when a drug is produced by a drug company, they get a couple of years to basically, where nobody else can produce it, it's copyright protected, and that's when they've got to make back all the money that they spend developing the drug. And there can be significant costs um, incurred by a drug company in bringing the drug to market. It can be 10 or 15 years of research and development. So to get an exclusive license, and you're talking big money, a couple of years ago, Siroxid, about 20 years ago, Siroxid, which is an antidepressant, got a six month extension on their copyright. A six month extension was worth a billion dollars in sales worldwide. That's the kind of money you're talking about. So Valium, basically, what the drug company wants to do is maybe in that time when they're the only person producing it, is make sure everybody goes Valium, 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 Valium. You're not allowed to say diazepam. You have to say Valium because they want that. When a doctor goes to prescribe it, they don't write diazepam because if they write diazepam, the chemist will give out any sort of diazepam, maybe not their one. They want it to be written as Valium, okay? So you have basically the drug name diazepam, you have the, the, the brand name, and then you have the company to produce it. And as I said, La Roche, or Hoffman La Roche, as it used to be known. Uh, in Dublin, La Roche is known as Roach, okay? Um, but it's, it's the same thing. And so that's why you have, um, uh, you know, people say Roach 10s and Roach 5s. So normally what you have with, with the, the Roach version of Valium when they sell it, you have the one side, so your 10 milligram tablet is a blue tablet, it is D10 on one side, and it's got Roach or Roche, whichever, on the other side. Now the other interesting thing is that um, they put ro Roach on every feckin' drug they make. And I don't think a lot of kids know that. So I have just this image of 16-year-old boys going around buying the, you know, the, the contraceptive pill because it's got Roach printed on it. God, I'm not high, but my nipples are very sensitive. Um, it, it's a weird kind of one. So it's something to be careful of. And there's a lot of these different benzodiazepines, OK? Diazepam, we've mentioned. Another big trade name for that is Anxicam, Cam and an uh, Anxiety. Um, the street name they're often known as is D5 or D10s. Blueies are yellows because the five are yellow and the 10s are blues. Sometimes roaches, sometimes valleys. There's different names for them. If you hear somebody say, oh, it's a, it's a D30 or a D45, they're actually talking about Dalmain. It's a different drug, but it's the same drug company. Um, you've, you've heard of um, Alprazolam, which is the drug name for Xanax. So Gerax is another brand name, or Xanax. Um, they're not very original when they come up with these names. Xanax, just change one letter, it will be grand. Um, and that's Upjohn or, or Xanax bars, sometimes they're known as. And then there's other ones there, Ativan, you know, they're blue as well. So people say, oh, it's a different kind of a bluey, because they're also blue. Um, so there's various different ones. Dalmain, the second one from the bottom, is D30 um, or D45, it's normally known as, because that's the strength it comes in. Um, and the last one, the bottom, is worth mentioning. You've all heard of Rohypnol? Yeah. That's the one where the brand name has really gone against the drug company because it became known as the date rape drug. And it really has backfired for them. I've never seen, in all my years of working as a psychiatric nurse, I've never seen Rohypnol prescribed for a pharmaceutical reason. I'm sure it is somewhere, but I've never seen it. Uh, it's just got a bad name. So there's just some of what they look like, um, the D10s and that sort of stuff, and that's your Dalmain in the middle. So they come in slightly different forms, and drug companies, when the different ones produce them, they might look slightly different. The one thing is to remember as well, dosages will vary, okay? So there's tables available in different books, and this is, you know, one that, um, I know you probably can't see that, but this red line that you have there is basically diazepam. So diazepam 10 milligram, which is the strongest tablet that comes in, is the very same as, at the very top, alprazolam 0.5 of a milligram. So this is where your mat set is going to come in, right? So 0.5 of a milligram of Valium, or sorry, of, of Xanax, is roughly equivalent to 10 milligrams of Valium. Does that make sense? So it, it, the numbers are not interchangeable, okay? And um, with, it, with the same with all the different benzos. So you need to be aware of, well, if this guy is taking six milligrams of, Valium, of Alprazolam, it doesn't sound too bad, but actually it's the equivalent of probably taking 120 milligrams of Valium. So it's, it, 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 it's, uh, you need to be careful with that. There's also a thing just to watch out for. Um, a milligram is a thousandth of a gram. A microgram is a millionth of a gram. So basically what you have is a situation is if the numbers are very small, sometimes they'll be written as micrograms. So your, your, one, uh, your uh, 0.25 milligram is the same as 250. So there is some very good pharma's genuine medical reasons for these drugs that we want to keep them. Like they shouldn't be banned because they have medical uses. Some of them are a bit devious and can be used for devious matters. They're quite a good anxiolytic, but the problem is people get tolerant and they end up being ineffective. So they're not, they're not very good for that in the long term. They can help people with sleep, so they're often used 
used um, as a sleeping tablet, Dalmain in particular is pretty much it. They, they can be hypnotic, they can be anticonvulsants, so they're often used for people with epileptic seizures and stuff like that. Um, and they can be used, they do have amnesia effects. So if you take Valium or any of the benzodiazepines, it affects your ability to make memories while you're stoned. So it's good thinking of Valium and all them a bit like alcohol. Do you know when somebody goes out and they kind of get really drunk and you're looking at them going, you're not going to remember this tomorrow? Valium and that can do that at very low doses. So the person doesn't have to appear intoxicated, but their ability to create memories are, are, are not very strong. Now that's good because if you've got to go and get a camera stuck up certain ends of you, they might need you awake to put the camera up you, but you don't want to remember that. So there, there, there's a good medical reason to have this, but hence you see where the date rape problem comes in. Okay? Um, some of the side effects of these drugs are kind of interesting. So sedation, they're, a, they're a, a, a kind of a hypnotic, they're a sedative, they tend to lead to drowsiness. You can have rebound anxiety, particularly with the shorter acting benzos like the Xanax and that sort of stuff. They, as we said, the amnesia, you get this kind of disassociative effect where people don't feel like themselves and you get this increased tolerance. One of the things that's interesting is it makes it very hard for people to remember. Um, and this was a study that was done looking at psychoeducation, CBT type interventions with people with panic disorder. And what they did was they gave these people with panic disorder education, but some of them were on benzos and some of them weren't. And what they found basically was the ability of the people on benzos to, take, to remember the education, the CBT information they were getting was just really, really bad. But they were on prescribed levels of 23 milligrams of Valium on average. Whereas some of the kids I meet who do take benzos sometimes will go, yeah, it was Saturday night, nothing else to do, I took 100 milligrams. So you can imagine what their memory is like comparative to these people. Um, so it is a, a kind of a practical thing if you've got a client you're working with who is taking benzos even kind of spor sporadically, that you know, you, that you'll do a really good session with them, they'll get really engaged, they'll go home, they'll come back three days later and you go, do you remember what we talked about last day? And they go, no. And it, so you just have to be patient. They're dangerous particularly in combination. Overdose of, of and dying from a benzodiazepine overdose on its own is relatively rare. The problem is lots of people who take a lot of benzodiazepines also combine them with alcohol and, and, and opiates and all that sort of stuff. So you tend to get, so that one across the top, the green one is all deaths. That orange one is, is heroin. Um, that red one is methadone. That's alcohol. And there's your diazepam and uh, your florazepam. So as you can see, they're involved in a fair few deaths but they don't tend to under own cause that many of them. Right, young people, this is a slight self-promotion of the book uh, myself and Bobby wrote. Um, when we wrote this book, it's out about four years, we, we talked about benzodiazepine use in it. And what we said was, in our experience, benzodiazepine misuse in, in, in adolescents tends to follow a binge pattern where the use of large numbers of tablets for a brief period of time, like a Saturday night, maybe Friday, Saturday night, and then maybe absence for even a couple of weeks. So you don't tend to meet young people, 16, 17, who are taking benzos every day. You do some of the time, but it's not the norm even among the benzo users. Does that seem reasonable? Okay. So this is just the service I work in and what we see. And what I'm going to do is, this is, the, for, uh, the, this is again pointing out the, to Carol the, the cannabis use. If you look at cannabis here, 96% of the kids coming to our treatment service have used cannabis. And 78% of them have used it in the last... 30 days, and the mean number of days, or the average number of days, was 15 days in the last month. Let's look at benzodiazepines, which is down here at the bottom. 50% of them have used them, but only 2% have used them in the last 30 days. And that ranged from basically two or three days up to maybe 28 days. There was one person who was taking them pretty much every day, but that's only one in a whole year. Um, I'm not going to, SPAD finds the same, basically, that the, the, the green line is Ireland, very patriotic, the orange line is the UK, we have fairly similar rates, that red line is France. Finally, we found something that the Mediterranean countries are worse at than us. Um, again, cases entering treatment who report that benzodiazepine is their main use, about 12-13% of the under-18 caseload report benzodiazepines as their main use. Um, Again, when we did a study looking at the play Yoda, where Bobby works now, we basically found about 7.6% had sedatives, which includes the Z drugs, which aren't te technically benzodiazepines, as their main drug. So they're just not coming up as the main drug.
cannabis and alcohol by far are. Um, what you do find is that the people who are out of school and out of education, so people in youth reach and those kind of places, are much more likely to have benzodiazepine misuse than the kids in school. Benzodiazepines, particularly among a lot of the kids I meet, when you say to them, you know, have you ever done heroin? They all look at you like you've two heads and go, no, who does heroin? Are you a weirdo? And when you say to them, have you ever done benzodiazepines? They now have the same kind of reaction. It's like they're getting a bad name on kids. No, I've got friends who did those. I've seen guys in the neighborhood doing those. Those things are crazy. Are you mad? I wouldn't do them. So that's probably a good thing. Um, but there are certainly, the, the more marginalized kids, I suppose, are more likely to be doing it. Right? Chicken and egg. Um, three categories of benzodiazepine use come up in the, in the literature. You get the therapeutic dose dependent, and this is the most common one that the health services have to deal with. You get people who go on, say, benzodiazepines for a, an anxiety problem or something like that, and it's a genuine anxiety problem, and they end up basically they end up st staying on this dose for years. You're only supposed to be on them for about four weeks, six weeks at most, and you have people who've been on benzodiazepine on the same dose for if, years, if not decades. And it's really difficult to try and get those people off because they're both emotionally dependent on it or psychologically dependent as well as the physical issue. Then there's the prescribed high dose kind of dependent. Um, but the one that's most common is this recreational benzodiazepine misuse where people are taking them again and again. Have you all come across people with benzodiazepine withdrawal? Yeah? Are you, are you nervous of it? No? Good. Um, because the, the the worry I have is that it's been overplayed a good bit. Have you ever heard of David Healy? David Healy is a, um, he's a, an Irish doctor. He was born in Dublin, trained in UCD, and here's why his credibility is so good. He did his psychiatric registrar training in Galway. Not related to Joe Canning, though. Um, and he actually, even if you want even more credibility, he then went to Castle Bar for a year and worked there too. But he basically is the world's expert basically on pharmaceutical medication. He's a professor of psychological medicine at the University of Bangor in Wales. And he was the expert witness that led to uh, Siroxet being basically uh, found to be dodgy. So he was the guy who went in and did the, the court appearances about 20 years ago. And what he basically found was that the drug companies were lying. This guy has lost jobs because drug companies will go to American universities and say, you hire David Healy, we ain't giving you any money for research. Okay, not a friend of the drug companies. Let's see what he says about benzodiazepines. While there does appear to be a significant number of people who have had problems withdrawal from benzodiazepine, these are sm a small, only a small proportion of the overall numbers of people who've had them. This would seem, therefore, that the dependent potential of benzodiazepines cannot be as serious as it is often claimed to be. If so, many people could have been prescribed these drugs so often over the course of 20 years and not had significant problems. How does that sound? Is that surprising? So what he's basically saying is lots of people take these benzodiazepines often for quite a long time and have very little dependency problem. So we overly worry about it. And um, he said some people seem more sensitive to withdrawal and at a quicker rate than other people, and they put that figure at somewhere around 20-25%. So it's not a universal thing that if you take benzodiazepines for a month, you will be dependent on them and you will need to be weaned off them, or for a year, or for two years, or whatever else. Okay? For those people who do get withdrawals, they often tend to be increased anxiety, poor sleep, unsteady gait, numbness, muscle pain, feeling things, uh, things moving like on a boat, aggression and depression, uh, weakness and tired, flu-like symptoms, um, hallucinations, paranoia, seizures. Now seizures is the one that people get very nervous of because there is a slight risk, very slight, a bit like alcohol, that if you kind of go cold turkey off a high dose of benzodiazepines, that your seizure threshold basically is affected and you could have a seizure, which can be very dangerous. It can be life-threatening. So people in theory can, but it's a very small proportion and it's very rare, and particularly where you'd be looking at it is where somebody has a previous history of, so if someone has epilepsy, or have a history of seizures, you'd be very nervous about that person and that risk of seizures, but it doesn't seem to be as big an issue as people worry about it. So you tend to get confusion, but you get confusion on the benzos as well, so coming off them is probably gonna to happen too, and you get these kind of depersonalization and all that sort of stuff. Use of benzodiazepines in all treatment episodes, as we said, is, is fairly high. The risk factors for withdrawal basically are higher doses, taken daily or nearly daily, um, unable to stop for a few days, 
gives someone very high risk. That's really what you're trying to find. Those people who are really at high risk are those people who are taking them for months and months and months, which lots of people who are attending, say, methadone clinics often are in Dublin, they will be taking, you know, 50 to 100 milligrams of Valium or more every day for, for, for maybe years. Those people are at very high risk. But not everybody is, and particularly, like I said, the kids I meet, uh, they tend not to be. Um, the guy I, I mentioned earlier on who was taking the, the, came to the service last year and was taking benzodiazepines 28 days in the last month, he was basically going out on a, on a Friday night and he was basically smoking a load of cannabis every day. He was drinking Friday, Saturday, Sunday. He was obviously smoking cigarettes. He was probably taking ecstasy and a bit of cocaine. And then on top of that, he was taking benzos most days for the last month. But only for about the last month was he taking them every day. And what happened was he'd wake up in an unmerciful hangover for, on, on the Monday morning and he'd go, never again, and he'd stop everything. So he was getting everything from nicotine withdrawals to, to, to cannabis withdrawals to benzodiazepine withdrawals. And when we just got him to calm down and look at what he wanted to change, he said, I want to stop the benzos because they're getting me to do all sorts of crazy stuff. They're getting in real trouble with the cops um, because it disinhibits you a bit like alcohol. And uh, he, I said, right, well, let's reduce them over the next week. Let's not worry about the cannabis. Let's not worry about if you have a few drinks on a Saturday night in the short term. He came back the next week and he said, I just stopped taking them. He'd know, and I didn't want him to stop that quickly, but he just went home and he just stopped taking them and he kept smoking his joint and he was grand. That, wasn't against, that was against medical advice, just so you know. There is short-acting benzodiazepine. Xanax and Ativan are short-acting. Librium and Valium are intermediate-acting, they're called. And then longer ones are things like Dalmain. So it just means how long they stay in the system. So what you tend to see is that with the short-acting ones, which are these ones, you tend to get a peak of kind of withdrawal symptoms at about five days, about a week, that kind of time. But with it, by 10 days, they're really dropping off in terms of the, the, the side effects or the withdrawal effects. But it can go on for a couple of weeks. But it starts within two days, goes on for up to four weeks. But it's around the, the end of the first week that it kind of it peaks. This is what the, uh, the, the longer term ones are, are like. It kind of comes on more gently, the withdrawal symptoms. It doesn't seem to subjectively feel as bad. But it, and it disappears more gradually, so it's less scary. Shorter acting drugs to get out of your system quicker generally tend to have more nasty kind of withdrawal effects. Is that fair enough? Um, and that's why you'll see in a minute when we talk about treatment, one of the things you do with people who are taking benzodiazepines, if you are going to detox them, is you swap them to a longer acting benzodiazepine. Okay? So there is some withdrawal scales out there. Are these, these slides are going up on the internet, are they? So you'll be able to see this. I'm not going to mention them. There is scales out there that can measure withdrawal symptoms of, from benzodiazepines. But there is a, this is the number of people who actually, 7.6% of people who have a primary substance use of benzodiazepine, that's their main substance, actually end up getting a detox. Now, some of that is to do with availability, but a large part is because a lot of them don't need it. Okay, it's not the first port of call. There is new community treatment guidelines for, um, for benzodiazepine withdrawal. Have you seen them? They're available free. Drugs.ie have them in a few other places. Have a read of them because they go through. What I'm going to give you here is the... I'll be nodded at here to get off the stage soon. The, 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 this is the... Uh, what I'm doing is robbing their, their, their information. What they basically say is that the first port of call is not drugs. It's not to... I mean, a guy has got... If a guy's coming into you saying... I've got 100 milligrams of Valium a day. I'm taking, that's 10 doses of 10 milligram every day. The last thing he needs is a prescription for 30 milligrams. He's got 100 of the feckers. Yeah? But people often try and line up a detox. Now think about it. The max daily dose of Valium is 30 milligrams. If you've got somebody coming in and you overnight say, well, we'll give you 30 milligrams, but you're not the top up, what's going to happen? He's going to have withdrawals. So if you've got a guy on 100 milligrams a day, being able to be in a position where you can transfer him to the 30 milligrams is miles off. And they say that the, what they further say in them is that a key worker should work with the person and start creating a drug diary. That basically the person comes in and they have, before they're even a candidate for a detox, a community detox, they would need to have at least two weeks of completed drug diaries. So there's a few weeks there of working with that person to see what it is. And often what you find is that if you're in that two weeks, as they're kind of cutting down and they're hopefully stopping, what you're doing is using your drug withdrawal scale to see how bad are their withdrawals. Because maybe they don't even need a, de a detox. 
and particularly if they've only been doing this for the last five or six weeks or something like that, they may not need it. Um, so basically what they're saying is that really that drug diaries of 14 days are needed and when the key worker feels that they're kind of ready to be reviewed by the GP, then they can go. But no GP is going to be giving someone 100 milligrams of Valium a day. It's just not going to happen. So there's no point in referring someone to the GP until they've started getting it down. And the big concern is, I know Bobby and me were involved in a case in Dublin years ago where basically we gave the guy the prescription and he just went out and he just basically topped up and topped up. So all we were doing was substituting his, his, his street use. So you have to be really careful when you give it. There's a lot of work to be done before you get to there. The, um, and really what you have to look at doing is, if for example it's a 17 year old, is mum or dad willing to take responsibility for the medications and dole them out? And is he prepared to sit in? Because there's no point in the guy saying, yeah, I'm going basically out partying with the lads you know, Friday, Saturday night, you won't see me, but I'll be with all the lads I normally do the benzodiazepine with, and you're giving them 30 milligrams during the day, because he'll just end up slipping. Um, so he, it, it has to be very seriously thought out. So that's the, the, the initial challenge. What they say is, just so you know, that you switch to an equivalent dose of, of, of um, diazepam, uh, because the, slow, the longer acting uh, diazepam as opposed to alprazolam means that the withdrawal um, effects actually aren't so bad. So therefore, stabilisation is the most kind of important thing and kind of understanding what's going on and then kind of detox if and when you get down to the 30 milligrams if it's needed. Okay, I won't get into all the doses stuff because that's all in the, uh, the, um, the uh, what is it called, the treatment guidelines that are online. For under 18s, the big problem is lots of GPs will be reluctant to prescribe. So that you, there is a challenge for areas if you do come across this where do you find a GP that's willing to prescribe, or some doctor, Yoda have it good, they've got Bobby, he can prescribe, but, but I asked Bobby last night, have you done a benzo detox? Hasn't done one for years. And he's the main prescriber for adolescent drug treatment in the country, and he hasn't done one. So I, it doesn't seem to be that big an issue with under 18s. Um, so it's, it's not something to worry about. That's the list of guidelines that's there. I'll be around a bit if people have questions. Whew.